Joining us right now is Lane Kentworthy, professor of sociology at the University of California at San Diego, and also the author of the book, Social Democratic America, the perfect person to interview uh, about Bernie Sanders. Welcome to the show. Hi. You, so in the New York Times today, you said, I think Bernie Sanders' use of the word socialism is causing much more confusion than it, than it is adding value, but it's kind of a little late for that form. I mean, he's been going with that uh, label for a long time. So let's begin with what is a democratic socialist, because people don't seem to know. How would you define it? Well, it's hard to say because I don't think very many people use the term anymore. There are, there are still some in the United States who do it and a few in Europe, and there are indeed even a few uh, parties in France, for example, in Spain that still call themselves socialist. But most everyone has moved away from that and now uses terms like social democrat or progressive or sort of the far end of liberalism. So... Uh, most people use the term socialism today, distinguish it from capitalism, and use it in its kind of classic meaning, which has to do with the government owning uh, a good bit of the means of production, nationalizing some industries, and so on. And because that's now very much out of favor among most of the left across the rich countries in the world, I think the term just isn't used all that much. It, it was uh, in some of the countries in Northern Europe uh, and Western Continental Europe. It used to be used in the 1960s and 1970s uh, in the same way that today we say progressive or social democrat. Uh, but it's just not all that common anymore. And I suspect that Bernie Sanders' use of it comes from the fact that that's when he came of age. And so he probably began calling himself that in the late 1970s, and it has just sort of stuck with it. And you said that he is a democratic socialist capitalist. He's not really a socialist, is he? No, I, not in not in the way that most people use the terms uh, the term today. He's not in favor of nationalizing any of of our industry, um, not even the banks, really. Although I, I can't remember where he stood on that in two thousand eight. But it, even if he f- was in favor of it, it would have been temporary. He wants to break them up primarily right. and make them smaller. That's right. And he's going to, I was critical of him. I said as soon as Donald Trump called him a communist, he should have came out swinging. He cannot get rid of this label. He might as well own it and explain it and eloquently talk about who he is and what he stands for. So he's going to give this big speech. What should he say in this speech, in your view, that could persuade Americans? Or maybe it's a hopeless task. What's your view on that? Well, I don't have any particular interest in the the term or the label per se. What I think he simply needs to do is what he's been doing all along, and maybe uh, perhaps even more clearly, uh, focus on the on the policies that he wants to enact. That's the, the key thing, not what label gets attached to him, what label he uses or what label other people will, uh, will use. I mean, uh, President Obama was called a socialist repeatedly in his first few years in office, even though he's nothing close to it. So he's not going to be able to stop others from labeling him, and he seems to like the label, so I agree with you, you might as well own it. But the key thing really is, I think, to focus not so much on the label and and mostly just on the content of his policies. That's what's interesting to me, and I agree with him as it happens on uh, on a lot of what he hopes to enact. Well, here, here's the problem with that, though. Here's a Gallup poll from June 2015. 93% of people vote for a Catholic. Uh, 91% for somebody Jewish, 81% for somebody Mormon, 74% for somebody gay or lesbian, uh, an atheist, 58%, a socialist comes in dead last, a Muslim at 60%, that, that's, that's, um, and a socialist dead last at 47%. So that I think that's the albatross. I mean, for only 47% said they'd vote for somebody who, who was a socialist, and that's why I think he's got a I think it is a big task ahead of him having to educate people on that particular word. I agree. I, so I think he should say, if, if I were him or if I was his, uh, his advisor, I would tell him to say essentially what I have here, which is that this, the use of this term comes from a particular period in history. He's not in favor of nationalizing anything significant in the United States. Um, he is in favor of uh, these particular policies. That's what he stands for. I don't. I don't think he should back away from the term now. Then he'll he'll uh, simply cause an even bigger ruckus, and that'll distract even more attention. Yeah, then he'll be a flip flopper. Yeah, then he'll be a right. flip flopper, a waffler. They, they, he can't do. He just simply cannot do that. 
there were in each nation is the across the world is the notion of socialism different is it there there from nation to nation i mean it seems like it's one of these ambiguous uh, um, uh like an a big amoeba where it means something somewhere and something different somewhere else that's right and you know just as an aside you could say the same thing about capitalism so some people when they think capitalism they think of it in a a very simple basic sense as a, a market economy with mostly private ownership but other people attach all kinds of additional content onto that term so they think of capitalism as implying uh extensive freedoms and very very little government intervention when in fact if you look across the world there are all kinds of different capitalisms all kinds of different mixes of uh uh, markets and private ownership and public ownership and government intervention and government intervention in, in different areas and in different ways. So there's regulation of this and that, and there are all kinds of uh, welfare state or safety net programs. So uh, any of these terms tend to get thrown around and mean different things to different people in different contexts. There's, there's just no way of getting around that. Our guest is Lane Kentworthy, professor of sociology at the University of California at San Diego. Much nicer weather than we have. And also the author of the book, Social Democratic America. So, Lane, what would you say is the truest socialist nation in, 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 that adheres most closely to what most people think of socialism in the world today? Is it Denmark? Although they haven't really run that country in a while. No, it's not. It's not Denmark at all. Denmark, I think, is a very much a, a capitalist country with a, a very large welfare state, uh, and that, in, you know, that in fact is what Bernie Sanders uh, wants to do. And he mentioned Denmark and Sweden in the the debate, and has mentioned them on the campaign trail. Um, so, no, D- Denmark wouldn't qualify. It's it's hard to say. So, again, I think of socialism mainly as having to do with who owns. Uh, the means of production, to use an old Marxian term, um, who owns the property, if you will. And there are hardly any truly socialist countries left. I mean, China still partially qualifies, although it has a very marketized economy. Uh, but here, too, we should probably distinguish who owns the uh, the, the industry and, um, and other things that you can own versus the question of whether you operate using markets or some kind of planning. Uh, so I don't, I don't know that there really is any genuinely socialist or even close to socialist country anymore. Now, a lot of people are unfamiliar with Scandinavia, Denmark, and that's why the example goes over a lot of people's heads. But it is true in surveys, they are repeatedly and and, and consistently the happiest people in the world in Sweden and Denmark and, and, uh, and those countries uh, who have that system he's talking about. That's right. I, I think they do a lot of things very well. They, they're not only happy, but they have very low poverty, a, a lot of economic security, very little hardship uh, for those at the bottom, a great deal of opportunity, arguably uh, less inequality of opportunity than we have here. Um, so it, it's a it's a very good setup. They have very smart policies. The rebuttal or rejoinder is always that well these are tiny countries, um, but but that doesn't really get at the key question, which is could a, a large country like the United States adopt the same kind of policies that that have been key to their success? And I think the fact that we have Social Security and Medicare and a variety of other welfare state policies suggests that uh, almost certainly we could. There's nothing fundamentally different about universal early education or paid parental leave or paid sickness leave. So there's just no, the the idea that somehow these types of things can only work in a small country, uh, it's just a, it's a bit of a facile objection, I think. It's something that people throw out because they can't really think of any other reason to to object other than to scream socialist or something like that. Yeah, or communist, like, like Trump. And another example that is larger, not as large as the U.S., but certainly landmass wise and and larger in population than Denmark is Canada and they have not they, it's not as uh, far as as Denmark but they also have uh, their policies are more similar than ours and it's going to be even more so with Justin Trudeau winning the election today and the liberals coming back into government that's right so Canada operates a single payer health care system very effectively and does a number of other things they have a a child allowance that'll give a, a low income family with two kids about six thousand dollars a year in in support compared to our child tax credit which will give you about one thousand dollar a year and 
I, I'm not saying necessarily that 6,000 is right. Maybe 5,000 is better or 8,000. It's hard to say exactly. But the point is uh, they've done a, a very good job of helping kids in low-income families with this particular policy, and there's no reason why that policy would work better or worse in a country that's, uh, that's small or large. I, I think the same thing holds for, uh, for early education, where France and Belgium, uh, France is a much bigger country than, uh, than Denmark or even than Canada, but it runs a, a pretty effective system of comprehensive early education that that's very good for parents and kids by all uh, by all reckonings now bernie sanders has been pointing out examples of socialism in this country and you pointed out i believe medicare and social security he pointed out the police department and the fire department is what he said uh yesterday what are some more examples that come to mind in this country what you would consider either socialist or or partially socialist programs that people like but they don't really know or are services they use that could be considered such right so there he's pointing to examples that really are closer to what uh, most people would think of as social socialism where the government actually is employing uh, folks that's true of the health care system in some countries like England and Sweden but it's not true in many others like uh, Germany or Canada even though they they do have universal coverage um, so other examples include things like uh, public libraries uh, the Veterans Administration which um, for the most part does a very good job although it had this really bad scandal uh, in the past year um, those are cases where the the government's not only paying for the service but is hiring the the people who provide the service and that's closer to what uh, is normally thought of as socialism but that's not i should emphasize what uh, oh and by the way um, uh, our k through 12 schooling system also qualifies as well as uh, most public universities around the country um, but that's not what bernie sanders is advocating for most of the of the policies whether it's paid parental leave or paid sickness leave for uh, uh, or others so this is more of a capitalism with a, a strong safety net. Exactly. That's exactly right. Thank you so much for shedding some light on this today. Lane Kentworthy, professor of sociology at the University of California at San Diego. And before we go, just tell us a little something about your, your book. Well, my book uh, suggests that the United States, although we're normally thought of as a, a laggard in terms of the development of a, a welfare state or public insurance compared to countries like Denmark or even Germany or Canada, uh, we've nevertheless come a long way over the last century, and I argue that in all probability over the next half century or so, so I'm thinking very much intermediate or long term, we'll continue to move in that direction and end up more like, say, Denmark or Sweden uh, is today than uh, than like we are, and, and certainly than like we were uh, a century or so ago. So if you're a, a fan of Bernie Sanders or even the, the policies that Hillary Clinton would propose to enact, you, you probably uh, may take heart in the optimistic uh, outlook that I, that I argue for. Thank you, Lane Kentworthy, uh, professor at sociology at University of California at San Diego. I appreciate you being on the Wayne Besson Show. Quite welcome. Thank you. I'll be back in a minute. The Wayne Besson Show.